Hello everyone and welcome to a continuation of our series Structural Modeling and Design of a Highway Bridge. In this video we are going to give a rough description of the structure as a precursor to starting to modeling the structure. Now please notice that if you are new to this series, this is a part of a video series about highway bridges, the structural design thereof, and I'm gonna link a video on the top right. It's very important that you see the first one, which will also link right now on the top right. In this video, we are going to give a description of the structure, and as I said, we are going to be designing the highway bridge from A to Z to our best of knowledge. With that being said, I hope you enjoy, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Alright, so first of all, I want to give you a small schematic of the highway bridge. There are some information that are redacted for obvious reasons. However, I am producing my AutoCAD version of the drawing, which is basically here to be able to use and show this freely. Anyway, the highway bridge is basically a deck of the highway bridge carried by some piers, and those piers are carried by foundation, which are in turn piled. The distances are something I will explain next time, as well as the layout of that. But you need to understand that this is a huge highway bridge gapping multiple roads. You can see here the longitudinal section of the highway bridge with its various heights. You can see that there are some roads below the highway bridge. Now this box that you see here, this is called the vertical clearance envelope. Depending on the highway bridge you have, you might have a certain clearance envelope required. For example, if you hang a sign that says 5 meters maximum height, then you would have to have at least 6 meters or more of vertical clearance. Now remember, I am not a highway design engineer, so I might mess this up. Feel free in the comment section to tell me what the minimum height should be uh, in, relevant, in, in relationship to the sign you put there. Anyway, in this bridge, the minimum clearance height is 6,000 millimeters or 6 meters, meaning that there is always an invisible box uh, surrounding any road and the, the, the bridge shall not pass through the box. And this has been done or taken into account when laying out the bridge. There are some points I want to mention here. Those are the center lines of piers. You can see one of the piers monolithic with a small undertone here. Why is it monolithic? I will explain this later. Also, there is something called a structural joint, and I will talk about this also later. But for now, this is how the bridge looks like. Notice this is only one part of the bridge because I still have to show the other parts. There is no space for the page. And also the width of the bridge is 18.25 meters with a carriageway of 11.25 meters and the rest being shoulders. Of course, including the barriers. So this is the schematic, the general schematic of the highway bridge. It's very important to note that in the beginning, the bridge rests on an abutment and there is something called an approach slab here, which is basically uh, what connects the existing road with the bridge. What are the general things I want to mention here? The first general thing I want to mention here is that our bridge is going to be a multi-cellular box girder bridge. This is a box girder bridge. It's called multicellular because you can see that the box girder is made out of various cells that are connected together. There are also box girders where there is only one single cell, like in the middle, and that's it. But our box girder is a multicellular one, so this is worth mentioning. The box girder is post-tensioned, and of course our substructure comprises of the piers, as I said before, and the abutments. The abutments are the retaining walls, or basically the starting and the ending of the bridge. Furthermore, the foundation type is piles, and the mechanical bearings are of spherical type. There are a lot of mechanical bearings. The most uh, famous ones are the spherical type bearings. A spherical type bearing kind of looks like this in ready-made condition, or in the construction side, it looks like this. And of course, its exploded view is shown in the center. You have plates and elastomer material. Now, elastomer material is a cool way of saying rubber. It's just a high performance rubber or elastomer material. I might go into detail for this when we reach that, how we select our bearings. It's actually not as hard as you think. Like what you do is you have some sort of list with performance ranges for the bearings. You check out your bridge and you select your bearing based on the performance aspects of the bridge. 
So it's gonna be straightforward actually. Now the span arrangements, because there are spans, I mean if you look, there are some spans, like there are distances here. Now of course the question is based on what are the spans chosen? Here I will say the span arrangements and depths are mostly governed by existing roads, of course, as well as the clearances under the bridge. Now for the non-obstacle zones, meaning the zones where there are no uh, streets below, a reasonable span arrangement is to be adapted to produce economical design. Now an attentive CE channel viewer would say, wait a minute, okay, you are saying a reasonable span arrangement. And of course here you are, Dr. CE, you are going to say that, okay, this span arrangement is the most economical and that's it. And we are supposed to, you well, trust you, bro. Well, you taught us, I mean, if I learned anything from CE, it is to question everything. So how do you know that the span arrangement is the best? Like, okay, you are saying, trust me, that's the spans, trust me, those are reasonable, but well, I trust you, okay, and I'm pretty sure that you have done your thing, but in my case, if I have a project, how would I know the most reasonable and best span arrangements? Well, first of all, that's a very good question. In fact, the calculation presented here are usually done after a preliminary study. A preliminary study basically is conducted with different spans and a quick design, not a detailed one, a quick design and an approximate calculation of cost. And based on this cost, one alternative is selected. And usually bridges, those, those are not private owned, usually bridges are state owned. So when you as an, a consultant firm uh, prepare your different design alternatives, you would have to present it for the Ministry of Public Works or the equivalent ministry in your country. And there you would have to choose the alternative based on the cons and pros uh, presented. Usually, this initial study is actually one of your uh, things that you have to do, and it's usually in the terms of reference of the consultancy services when you are as a consultant. Notice the work we are doing here is consultant work. I personally was involved, I don't know if I have the files yet or not, I was personally involved in one of those bridges and we had to establish two possibilities one having one big bridge for both uh, traffic sides and one having two separate bridges. Of course, you would think, wait, one bridge for two sides? How is that possible? It was a straight bridge, not a curved bridge. So there is no super elevation. I know I'm dropping so many names and so many terms. I will come to them one by one. Anyway, back to our point. Okay, fine. You are going to make your initial study. Great. But are there any rules of thumbs? The answer is, Yes, there is a document called the Bridge Design Manual released by the PCI, the Priestess Concrete Institute. So you, they have some rule of thumbs. You can check them out under this document. This document is free. You can check it out. Now, this document shows a lot of things, but not the box girder. You can search for similar charts for the box girder if you want. It's not in the reference. This is one chart taken from the reference for a adjacent box girder. And you can see the performance chart. Like you can see the strands required. And because the strands required co reflect cost, you can see the performance ranges. Like for this and for this, you can see all those graphs that show you different performance ranges for different uh, heights of girders. This is, those are rule of thumbs you can use. All right, so after finishing this series, what would we have done, hopefully? Now notice that this series is going to be a very long one, like designing a bridge, and turning uh, work of consultants into video tutorial form is going to take some time. So please bear with me. We are going to design the longitudinal pre-stress of the bridge deck. There are longitudinal strands, mo tendons moving through the bridge, and we are going to design them. We are also going to design the flexural design of the deck. The deck is under bending moments, and we're going to design that. We also are going to design the shear and the twist on the deck. The twist here is part of it because your deck is curved. If the deck was straight, the twist becomes less of a problem. We're also gonna check the anchorage zone where the tendons are anchored, the bearing design, basically between the super and substructure, deck transverse design, meaning the design on the transverse direction, left and right, approach slab design and barrier design. Approach slab and barrier. Barrier is what you see here, there's concrete blocks. Approach slab is the pace just before the straight gets levitated above the ground. Abutment wall, head beam, piles, pile cap, there is a box culvert even, 
and some retaining walls. Everything is part of the scope of this video series. So it is a massive video series. And I will make sure I deliver upon my promises. Also, uh, I think at the bottom here, I forgot to mention that this is another box Gerda that you can see, a multi-cellular box Gerda. So yeah, you have multiple things. Anyway, so I asked the team of Record and Noob and CE. I know those people just don't know how to work together, but it's kind of hilarious. I asked them to check because I want to model the bridge, right? Now, I know that this bridge can be modeled using Midas or Midas. I don't know the pronunciation of that. It's um, M-I-D-A-S. However, I want to try do this in robots. Now, I tasked Record and Noobie and Editor CE to get a hang of it. And they told me that they can start with it. However, maybe during the middle point, I might switch to another software, depending on the abilities of robot. And I will tell you why. Because there are some questions I need to know if robot does them or not. Or at least those two dudes need to figure this out. I, I hope they don't uh, let me down. Anyway, here is the approach I'm going to do. And it's useful regardless of the software I'm using. Or they are using. First of all, for the longitudinal analysis, plan is to use Autodesk robot. Now, can it design pre-stressed concrete? Well, we need to see that. We need to calculate the section properties from the drawings. You have a drawing with a section. We need to calculate the section properties, IX, IY, IZ, and so on. We need to do ca capacity and stress checks. And we are going to model this using a linear element, a beam, a beam, a linear element, a beam element, just a beam. Now, there is a huge assumption behind that because you would think, wait a minute, you are using a line element. So there are some assumptions. What are the assumptions? We are assuming that it is mainly loaded in the longitudinal uh, direction and that the transverse distortions are small compared to the longitudinal deformation. Of course, the question is, is that true? Well, to some extent, it's all about the length versus width ratios. Or let me not, let me not say length, say span to width ratio to be a little bit more accurate. Uh, for example, you could actually model a hidden beam, like, I mean, think, let's, let's give another example. Forget about the bridge now. You have a hidden beam, a beam that is wide and very shallow. It's called hidden because it can hide within a ribbed slab. If, if the slab is 300, if the slab is 300 millimeters, the hidden beam doesn't show up in the slab. Let's say you have a hidden beam and those hidden beams, depending on the location on the world, usually have width of 1000 and a height of 300 maybe. So you see that usually this has the dimensions of the hidden beam, but we are still modeling it using a beam element. Now you could hypothetically model it using a slab element. And if you model it using a slab element, this means that you are saying that the transversal deflections shear moment is significant. However, usually for this, we just model it as a line element. This is what I'm talking about when we are saying that we are going to use a linear element to model that. The problem with the linear element is that it's going to be in 3D space because you have curvature and you have changes in height and you have changes in section. This is a nightmare scenario for modeling because the height changes each point. The section might change especially near the piers where the section gets bigger and uh, the horizontal directions or dimensions change. So there is a lot to be unpacked there. I hope that this team will be able to give me good news. Now, if we assume that the beam has ignorable transfer stuff, then, well, it works. The deck slab, the deck will be modeled using strain line segments. More to that later. Bearings are modeled with an elastic spring link. Special care is taken when connecting the bearing to the structure to reflect actual support conditions. Because the bearing doesn't support every direction, we need to model this correctly in the software. Also, for the section properties, this still needs some thinking. I am planning to draw uh, the section AutoCAD and use its commands to find the properties. Now, we will be using gross section properties, meaning there is no reduction in the moment of inertia. Is this okay? Well, Yes, you are pre-stressing the concrete and soon you will learn that the pre-stressing tendons are calculated to almost eliminate tension, so your cracking in the section is actually not that severe. The E-modus is calculated via Ashto. The self-weight is included by the software. Any extra load, for example, at the diaphragms. Now, what is a diaphragm? The diaphragm is basically the end of a span above the pier. Any extra load from the diaphragm is applied via point load. The live load is going to be done according to Ashto. 
Now we need to check if robot can actually find the worst case scenarios for the live load. For the French settlement, we need to be considerate. I will talk about this later. The gradient I explained last video is per the actual LFD. And for pre-stressing forces, I need to find a way to basically model pre-stressing forces in robot. And that's the make or break thing in that robot. So I have to really ask the team to make sure that they're able to do that. For now, that's everything I wanted to talk about today. This is like a precursor to what I am willing to do in the modeling. I hope you enjoyed. And with that being said, I want to give a curved bridge size shout out to many of the channel members in the contributor level and the helper level whose names are going to be shown on the screen. I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart as the support of the channel is priceless to me and enables me to provide you with videos hopefully on time and with a certain quality I try to achieve and for that I am forever thankful. In the end, I hope you enjoyed the video and you found it beneficial. If you have enjoyed the video, then please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting and so on, especially subscribing because it helps increase the reach of my channel. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye bye.